everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Spill the Facts, an online series produced by the International Decade for People of African Descent Assembly Guyana's Youth Committee. I'm Elsie Harry, and I will be your host for tonight. And my co-host is Mr. Matthew Gall. Tonight, we will have a very interesting topic on the importance of family structures in the African Guyanese community. And we have two phenomenal speakers who will be addressing this topic. But before we get into the presentations, I just want to invite you to do what we have done last week and what we will continue to do, and that is to observe a minute of silence for the persons of African descent right here in Guyana that have lost their lives and the persons around the world that are currently fighting for Black lives to be recognized, for Black lives to matter, for Black lives to be considered worthy because they are. So right now, please join me in a minute of silence. Thank you very much for that. I just want to say that I'm so happy to see all of you tuned in here. Hello to the persons who are tuned in on Facebook Live. Thank you so much for tuning in every week to have a discussion with us. So before we proceed, I want to invite you that if you have any questions or comments that you want to make during the presentations, feel free to type it in the Q&A section of your screen right at the bottom. You will see Q&A or you can use your chat feature. And when the presentations are over, we will be taking your questions and your comments. So before we do anything else, let me introduce our phenomenal speakers. They are Mr. Gabriel Christian and Miss Carlotta Budi Walcott. Let me introduce Mr. Christian. Gabriel J. Christian is principal of the law firm Gabriel J. Christian and Associates LLC in Bowie, USA. Mr. Christian studied law at Georgetown University Law Center in Washington, DC, graduating with the degree of jury doctor in 1991. Mr. Christian has distinguished himself as a Caribbean community leader in the Washington, DC metropolitan area. In 2007, Governor Martin O'Malley, governor of the state of Maryland, appointed Mr. Christian to the position of judicial commissioner of the Maryland Court of Appeals. Alongside his longtime collaborator and co-founder of Point Case Press, Canadian judge Irving W. Andre, Mr. Christian has authored and co-authored a number of books on Caribbean history, society, and politics, such as The Travails of a Caribbean Mini-State, 1992, and Sacrifice of the British West Indian Soldier, 2009. So I'm pretty sure you can go online and check out some of Mr. Christian's books. Matthew, do you want to go ahead and introduce our second speaker for tonight? Ms. Carlotta Bodie Walcott is a clinical psychologist who is passionate about educating and advocating for survivors of gender-based violence. In recent years, Ms. Carlotta has provided comprehensive trauma-informed therapeutic services in a residential setting for justice-involved adolescents and those in need of supervision. These therapeutic services include individual, group, and family therapy. As a psychotherapist, she uses a multimodal approach to provide a non-judgmental and a healing space for individuals to talk about their problems, build resilience, engender hope, and improve coping skills. So tonight we have two experienced and well-informed and qualified speakers to speak on our topic tonight. And we'll begin with a short presentation from Mr. Gabriel Christian. Thank you so very much. Good evening, everyone, and good evening to Ipadji. And uh, I want to take a moment to uh, send a warm tribute to my sister, Olive Sampson of Ipadji, and all the uh, young men and women who constitute this leadership. And I want to thank you for this very interesting opportunity here to share knowledge between myself, certainly Ms. Brody, and your audience on, on the importance of family in the African diaspora. Uh, Mr. Gall, I want to thank you, and uh, Ms. Harry, I want to thank you for uh, the uh, 
kindness that surrounds my being invited. Um, as you've said uh, that, and it is true, I practice law. A lot of the war law that I practice sometimes is linked to family law. But in a greater sense, uh, the most important thing is how I've been able to assess the success and or failure of our African diaspora community from the context or within the context of family life and how family life, how it is designed, how it is managed, whether it exists in the way that we uh, ought to have it as in a mother and a father sharing responsibility, uh, how that has affected our abilities to make progress post-emancipation. So let me, let, me, let me just start with some of his history. We in the African diaspora are displaced people. We were kid, our, our forebears were kidnapped off the coast of West Africa primarily and brought to the Western Hemisphere to grow sugarcane in the Caribbean, as in Guyana, cotton in the United States, corn, wheat, and in other places in the Americas, as in Colombia, to mine precious minerals as well. In that context as a labor force, the master, the system, was not interested in anything other than simply a labor force. So there's no encouragement of family, the family unit. You could be sold one day uh, from you know, your mother or father and never, never see them again. So it was only after 1834 in the British West Indies and 1865 in the United States, uh, where you had the two largest, uh, well, I guess, concentrations of African people. And I guess you could put Brazil Brazil would have been in the late 1880s, 1890s, that you began to have, with freedom, the opportunity for the African diaspora uh, persons to coagulate, get together in organized families without the uh, sort of oppressive boot on the neck, uh, as in the boot that was on the neck of uh, George Floyd, of our people to prevent us from getting together. Nonetheless, as is often said, past this prologue. So what that means essentially is that we are still dealing with the demons of chattel slavery. And we have to work through that. And I believe in the way that our law firm, in its assistance to the community in the family law arena, or involvement in community projects with the Caribbean community, of which the Guyanese community is a vibrant part, we need to look at about five to maybe 10 elements that I've sort of distilled from my experiences uh, as a member of a cohesive unit. Um, my father, Wendell Mackenzie Christian, was a soldier in the British Army with Guyanese as well, and folks from all of the other areas of the British West Indies during World War II. After the war, he was a police officer and a firefighter for about 30 years. Our mother was a teacher, Alberta. And she was a nurse at one point, and then later on, a civil servant dealing with the blind and ran the workshop for the blind in Dominica, where I was born. And during that time frame, they had seven children, four boys and three girls. And they were very strong on the following. They were very strong on discipline. We had not gotten anything post-emancipation. The masters had been paid compensation for having Africans as slaves. We had not gotten anything. Uh, the uh, freed Africans had to go to the land and make do. Some went to Guyana to mine gold, and this is like Mahaika, uh, became pork knockers. Others went to Cayenne, French Guyana, to do the same thing. Some went to Venezuela. Some went to Curacao to work in the oil fields. And those who didn't travel stayed home and became small farmers. Uh, both my peers were civil servants, and they were into discipline. They were into industry, they were into prayer, you know, they would say things like, you know, waste not, want not, make hay while the sun shines, spear the rod, spoil the child, so, you know, they engage in corporal punishment, we didn't like it, um, I've never admitted that to my two kids, my boy and my girl, but growing up in a family that was cohesive, that was prayerful, that was dedicated to education, another thing was, we, because we did not get land, we did not get any compensation, that is our forebears, the African diaspora families in the Caribbean in particular that thrived, thrived because 
of a facility with the English language, numeracy, meaning an ability to do math, arithmetic and mathematics, and a strong drive to excel academically. So in the United States, you would find at college, when I was a college, the Caribbean students from Guyana, from Jamaica, from Trinidad, from Dominica were among the best students of color and best students, period, black or white, because we came with the immigrant ethic and we came to win victory for our kind. So discipline, prayerfulness, industry, degree of emotional intelligence, you know, um, things are not always well within families. You may have a quarrel. What do you do? Do you leave the house? Do you fight with your wife? Does the wife fight with the husband? Do you throw furniture and break the door and break the glass and break the um, things in the nice cabinet and so on? Or do you uh, take a deep breath and exercise emotional discipline, emotional intelligence to understand uh, the way in which one can solve conflict? So I, I'm really happy to be here this evening to share with you some of my own personal experiences as someone who grew up in a family, an uh, African diaspora family in the 1960s and 70s, and as someone who as a lawyer in the African diaspora communities in the United States has been able to observe that which works in keeping families together. By the way, my father died at 90. Uh, he was married to my mother for 57 years. So they were married for 57 years. And my mother will be 91 tomorrow. She's still with us, thank God. But they had very strong values. And in fact, uh, our mother uh, put a book together uh, called A Woman of Substance, which spoke to how they were just really up from slavery in the 1930s, the war period, really limited means. But that through education and discipline and the exercise of an indomitable faith and a strong emotional intelligence, they were able to make much with little and to see that your kids were well-educated, well-disciplined and successful. So I'd be happy to explore that a lot more during the course of our discussion, but I'm happy for the opportunity to be on this program. And I want to thank you, Padaji, again, for putting on such a wonderful program of such great importance. Thank you so much for that presentation, Mr. Christian. And when you were saying some of the proverbs, I thought of my own parents because they always speak in proverbs and one of their favorite ones is day run till night catch them if people are on here and you know what that means or you've heard it before feel free to let us know in the comments and you can also let us know what other proverbs your parents used to use in their parenting in african guyanese households our next speaker is Ms. Carlotta Booty Walcott. Ms. Booty Walcott, the floor is yours. Thank you and good evening to all. It's a, a joy, it's a joy to be here in such good company. And um, thank you very much for the privilege of um, sharing this space. Uh, yes, as um, Gabriel was talking and mentioning those proverbs, I, I recall one that we live by, and I have also raised my children, um, do unto others as you will have them do unto you. And um, that is something in, in my family that we uh, grew up with, many others, but this one is one I share all the time because my mother, my father, constantly, because it was six of us in the household and people will be you know, arguing and fighting a little bit and taking stuff and they say, okay, do unto others as you will have them do unto you. So we grew up with that one. But thank you, it was, such, it was so nostalgic to, to just sit here and smile and remember. But, um, you know, indeed the family and the family structure is the most, um, the single most important influence um, in, in our lives, in the lives of children and in the lives of our own self-development. And one of the things that is so important for us is socialization and our culture, uh, recalling the history lesson um, from, from, from Mr. Christian, you would know that our culture was essentially uh, taken from us 
And even today, as we experience life um, here in Guyana, more particularly um, in African or afro guyanese communities and household, we, we have, we're forging, as it were, a whole new culture. And sometimes the, the rich, rich history is not research and told stories um, of our four parents um, are not told uh, and um, they are not even known. So that is one of the, the areas that as African or afro guyanese uh, in this community, that is something that we need to once again uh, first of all, research, get to know, and tell our stories uh, to our children. But, um, you know, again, going back to the history lesson, uh, we were very accustomed history of sometimes you come into these parts and you don't come with your, your entire nuclear family, people that you were once associated with. And so here in, in Guyana and in African communities, you will find that we do not necessarily have what is known as the traditional uh, family structures where there are two married, same, uh, not same sex, <laughs> heterosex uh, couples raising children. Um, now we have families that look different. Um, it could be an extended family. It can be a step family. It can be same sex family. And all of those families are represented in our communities. But what is, what is very uh, important is that family, the structure and the, the foundation of the family is undergirded with love and respect, bringing that sense of belonging. Like, like you heard in my brief bio, I've done a lot of work with families and a lot of pillars or foundational elements are sometimes lacking or missing or threatened a sense of belonging it's it's almost as though um with both parents being out of the home uh in some cases the grandparents are also working because of the in in some cases the ages you know People are getting children earlier and earlier, and sometimes a grandparent is is fifty, and uh, the the family, uh, you know, the parents are about thirty five. So the grandparents are working, both parents are working, and so the children are sometimes uh, left unattended or not given the the appropriate so to speak, amount of support. And as a result, this sense of feeling loved, a part of, accepted uh, is sometimes that pillar is not strong enough or is missing. Remember that the family unit, and you know, I keep referring to Gabriel's presentation because it, it just brought up so many fond memories of growing up in a home uh, where there were values that were known. And sometimes this, the, when the structure is not solid, when the foundation is not well laid, then these stories, um, we don't have these stories and these precious memories to share. So understanding um, that the, the, the structure, uh, the sense of being or belonging, the sense of being cared for, the emotional and social support that one will uh, 
derive from being a part of something that is stable, something that is nurturing, uh, something that has strong and very deep roots is, is very important. And so for me, um, in, the in, in my own experience growing up with being a household mother and father at one point, uh, with six of us siblings, just understanding deep values of hard work, understanding deep values of respect um, and of, of sharing and caring, those values, a part of being a part of that family will then put you, will affect your development and place you in society, uh, determining your positioning, determining your, your outlook, determining your success. Not to, um, not that we will not acknowledge in this space uh, the disadvantage uh, that, that African or Black people experience, uh, not to acknowledge that uh, the platform is not leveled, not, and not that we're not acknowledging that there, we lack equity, um, but still we flourish, still with a strong foundation and a structure that, that um, encourages growth, that is nurturing, we can still attain. So I, I would like us to uh, continue exploring how, where we're at at this moment, how we can use the foundations that we have, how we can strengthen them, how we can cause them to go even deeper, and then how we can use those to, to launch ourselves and our children um, so that they can be, they are meaningful, but they can be recognized as in, in, this, in this society and in the day and time, I mean, in which we live. Thank you very much, Ms. Carlotta, for those introductory remarks. Uh, question to the panelists. What would you say has been the impact of enslavement on the development of Afro families? One of the things I was, um, I, I mean, our family, uh, after this awful experience of um, George Floyd uh, being murdered in such an awful, gruesome way in, in front of our very eyes, we've started to talk about um, where, we, how we got here. And, you know, just being taken from a place where you, uh, that you're, your place, your place, your space, your culture, and your language, and then being transported in such um, horrific conditions and being enslaved, being your name being taken, your culture being taken, your religion being taken, your food being taken away. To, sometimes I, I feel it is embedded in our DNA and just the, the whole, the, the sense of not belonging and the oppression that continues it affects, it affects us because it is so deeply rooted. I, I, I sometimes say it is, it has become, so to speak, a part of our DNA and it affects our thought process. It affects sometimes the, uh, the our concept of self, uh, someone lo using power, not only using their power, but taking yours. And sometimes it brings us to, um, I see sometimes learn helplessness. And uh, so I find that there, there are a myriad of things, a myriad of ways that, that slavery has impacted. And because a significant um, uh, amount of black people 
are people of African descent. We have not taken time to study or learn our history and understand what has happened and how we how we have gotten here and where we are now and how we can use the past to influence and instruct how we move into the future. We are still experiencing many gaps. Not that I am, it's not that I am uh, not acknowledging the disadvantage and, and all of that, but just not knowing, just not researching, just not having these stories told and passed on is also negatively impacting. Mr. Christian, do you have anything to add to this well, question? Well, I, 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 I cannot but uh, be affected in the most positive way by the very kind words of our sister uh, Bodhi Walcott. Uh, sister Bodhi Walcott's uh, comments uh, mean to me that we do have in our community a degree of synchronicity, that we do have a degree of uh, what you say, connective tissue, because she was able to, uh, what you call associate and uh, appreciate the comments that I made, because I'm certain in her past was that sort of family structure that allowed for her to be the professional that she is today. So I'm sure uh, that there was a kind of kindness, the empathy, the hearing, the strong discipline, because I, I want us to understand something, and that is, I'm an optimist. I believe that considering that we were derived from a Holocaust, the African Holocaust, for almost 300 years, torn from our ancestral homeland, subjected to some of the most brutal conditions ever devised by man, and then inserted into the most exploitative system, the exploitation of man by man, to create the wealth that gave birth to the Industrial Revolution, yet, still we rise yet still we rise but we have our issues and i want to say something tonight to mr paul and sister elsie harry and to sister shanetta low who was so kind as to invite me to padiji's family session i'm listening to sister Bodie walker and i realized something spectacular in all my professional life and certainly my youth this is the first panel I've ever been part of on the issue of family. And I'm going to send a challenge out to us this evening. That Ipadaji this year, despite whatever might have happened in the political arena, that people may feel is the end of the world, it's not, to hold in Guyana the first annual Guyanese family reunion. The first annual Guyana or Guyanese family reunion. And open it up. Open it up for indigenous Guyanese. Open it up for Indo-Guyanese. Open it up for Afro-Guyanese. And let us see the mingling of families, as Sister Bodhi says, sharing our stories. It is so important to understand that despite the vicissitudes suffered by African Americans, African Americans developed 125 HBCUs, albeit with black, with white partners, with Jewish partners, because they've always been in the African American experience, strong, progressive white partners like John Brown, who gave his life to abolish slavery, Abraham Lincoln, who was assassinated because of the battle he fought in the Civil War to abolish slavery. 125 historically black colleges and universities. My brother went to Howard University Medical School. I went to the University of the District of Columbia. Both of those schools are predominantly Afro-American schools. Similarly, in Guyana, with little, but their faith and their indomitable spirit, their Afro-Guyanese were able to develop villages they had not been given any compensation, but yet they were able to rise and send their sons and daughters to university. Well, before that, Queen's College, QC, I think it's called, 
and to other places overseas and to do great things. So what are the problems that we have though that Sister Bodhi alluded to? I have very little sympathy for a trait that exists among us. There are two, there are several, but I'll mention two. One is the trait of the male stud. In the days of slavery, they took a strong black male and they had him go on and impregnate the males without any conscience because he was being driven to do that by the master. Slavery is gone. But there are some men, some brothers, misguided as they are, who will meet a sister and who have no intention of marrying her, who have no intention of settling down with her, but will use her sexually, sometimes impregnate her, and then move on. And what happens, you have a child who's growing up without a father, mother is struggling, and there are, Sister Bodhi will maybe give us more insight because she's a trained uh, psychologist in this, uh, for, on this forum. There are issues that derive from a child growing up without a father or with a mother who's abused because of domestic violence. That's another issue. Brothers, sometimes sisters, but brothers primarily must learn never ever to raise your hand on your woman, on your wife, on your girlfriend. It is a terrible thing because when you beat your female partner, it is akin to beating your mother. It's as if you're beating your mother. And so you're not only abusing your female partner, you're also abusing yourself. You are dehumanizing yourself. And as a dehumanized actor in society, then you are not capable of being as fruitful, as useful as you could be. So these are two things that we have to eradicate from our Afro diaspora, African diaspora communities, wherever they may be. And in Africa, I'm sure, but we have to talk about the diaspora because we are in the diaspora. So charity begins at home. That's another uh, thing I'm sure the body will appreciate. So let us begin in our homes by this reference. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Thank you, Mr. Christian. And while you were making your comments uh, and you, you noted some of the traits that you do not appreciate in the, African, in the African families today, and even as Ms. Booty was making her presentation and she spoke about some of the traits that she learned from her family and that we usually learn from our families, I wanna ask both of you, what is the state of the African family today? Ms. Booty, you can tell us about the African Guyanese family, what state they're in right now. And Mr. Christian, you can tell us about the African American and African Caribbean family. What are we seeing right now? Um, thankfully, we are still seeing that African Guyanese are educated. We're still seeing um, we still have consider considerable amount of professionals, educated, hardworking, um, resilient families. Of course, we need to do some work around how we nurture, how we care. We need to do some work around um, gender-based violent, all right? Uh, because it is very important for us to understand. And again, I allude to what uh, Brother Gabriel was saying earlier, the, the two things to eradicate and one being the violence because uh, that interruption, that violence that is experienced uh, let us say it is the male to female violence, but their children in the home, whether they are hit, emotionally abused, called names, neglected, just observing or witnessing violence in the home is a traumatic experience that is 
that affects, that is laid, a trauma laid on their, um, the brain and they do not forget it easily. It follows you into adulthood. It affects primarily the attachment, the secure attachment to, of that child to the parent. And when a child is not securely attached, what I'm saying is that that deep and enduring emotional bond with the parent and in in this case the 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 primary provider meaning the mother when the mother is battling domestic violence in the home she is unable to have a secure attachment with with the child and so it is very important for us to confront to have open conversations and to understand that we need actions that will reduce incidents of violence in the home. And we have actions that will make such behavior socially and culturally unacceptable. So on one hand, the state of the African community is strong, is enduring, uh, on the other hand, there is significant violence in the home. There is uh, the, the music, some of the social and cultural things that, that are having a very negative impact on development in terms of child development, um, in terms of self-actualization. Uh, those things, we need reformation around it. We need more conversation. We need to be able to hold each other accountable. So that's the balance. Both things are true in my view. Mr. Christian. Well, I, I just want to second uh, the motion, as you would say, uh, I guess we belong now, Sister Bodhi, to the Mutual Admiration Society. Mass, but I, I want to um, affirm what you've said that we need to have more discussion around this. And that's why I immediately said to myself, when we have meetings such as this, we have to ask ourselves, what is the deliverable that we seek, right? We don't want to simply have a discussion, right? And we engage in uh, useful banter or sharing of ideas, but not seek to provide an institutional framework within which we can ensure continuity of the knowledge sharing, of the information sharing, of technique sharing, of networking. I have observed the Jewish community very well. The Jews, as you know, came from Israel and they were scattered to the four winds. When Jesus Christ was crucified, he was crucified under a gentleman called Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate was a Roman. The Romans occupied Israel. And the Jews were scattered. The ghetto, the term ghetto, does not come from the African-American experience. Although in recent years, recent time, it has become associated with the African-American ex experience. The term ghetto comes from the Jews in Europe who were restricted in what they could do, where they could live, where they could work, and they were settled in these tight communities or ghettos. But somewhere I read, necessity is the mother of invention. And so they had the word, i.e. the Torah or the Bible, and they were able to cohere. And though they were discriminated against, they focused on what it is they could do. And their wealth was not gold or silver or diamond, although they became very uh, proficient in being smiths to fashion those things into jewelry. There are some people who say the word jewelry itself has its roots in the Jewish community. But what their focus was on, and Sister Bodhi uh, alluded to that in Guyana, that is a pleasing thing to see, not only in Guyana, but in the British West Indies in general, education is very prized in our community. The Jews focused on knowledge of self. They never forgot their heritage. And they focused on education. So you find there's an inordinate amount of Jewish uh, success stories in academia, in the arts, in the sciences. 
Likewise, it's interesting that the only two Nobel Prizes for other than literature until recently, I think, when Toni Morrison became a Nobel Prize winner for literature, was one for economics, for Arthur Lewis from St. Lucia, and the other for literature. First, the Afro Solution, Derek Walcott, and then later on, the Indo Trinidadian, uh, I believe, V.S. Naipaul. So, we as a people value education. I want to make mention before just concluding this segment about the issue of domestic violence. Children are what they learn. I repeat, children are what they learn. So if a child grows up in a house where the father is drinking, he's beating the mother, he's breaking things, he's breaking the furniture, and so on and so forth, that child, nurtured in that corrupt circumstance, when he or she becomes older, will resort to violence in problem solving. Right? So I tell people, you know, if in my in my I, when I counsel my clients, if you're angry. Walk away, leave the house, take a rock, take a ride, go to the park, take a walk, blow off some steam somewhere else. And when you've sufficiently resolved the angst or the conflict, return home. My father had a very interesting statement that he made always, and I remember it. He said to me, son, never let the sun, S-U-N, go down on your anger. Never let the sun go down on your anger. What he meant by that was try to find a way, even where you are not the one at fault, it doesn't matter. You have to sometimes stoop to conquer. Apologize. Apologize. He would sometimes, if my mother and father, they were not perfect, they had a quarrel, he would make a joke at the end and just, you know, it would all disappear in laughter. Right? And so... I remember as a child, once they had a little conflict. It was 1967, six, maybe 68. And he bought a very fine, in those days, Caribbean women wore a lot of talcum powder. Johnson's baby powder and My Fair Lady. Listen to the name, Ipadaji, My Fair Lady. My Fair Lady was a woman with a mink coat, white woman, so on. And uh, women would put the powder on their breasts and on their face, you know, I guess, residue of slavery. We were socialized to believe white was right. If you're brown, stick around. If you're black, stay back. So West Indian women would use a lot of powder. But my mother was working as a nurse, and we didn't have a vehicle at that time. And when she got off, one of her male nurse friends who had a motorcycle offered her a ride. You know, if you're a woman riding on a motorcycle and you're on the pillion there, you know, you got to hold on to something. So she held the gentleman around her, his waist. And I think the guy was passing through the town of Roseau, and a firefighter who my father uh, was the commander of said uh, to my father, oh, Christian, I saw your wife on a motorcycle holding a guy around the waist. My father came home, and he was blue vexed. I don't know where my other siblings were, but I only remember myself, my mother, and my father. And they got into it, and on his dying bed, my father would laugh and say that I came between them. And I said, stop mommy, stop it, daddy. What do you want to do? You want the neighbors to hear your business? And uh, no more blows passed. And that uh, episode was never repeated. And they lived together happily until 57 years of marriage. So emotional intelligence is important. It's important to be able to have conversation. Uh, both my parents were very studious. They read books. They had not gone to university, but they read books on good homekeeping. So none of us have the magic bullet. It's important to educate ourselves about homekeeping, home economics. My father baked cakes, he baked breads. I can, I can bake cake just from having looked at my father. I can bake black cake from memory, from having watched my father do it. And so that whole idea of being around the table, holding hands in prayer, discussing world news. I can remember the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. It was discussed at our table. I was eight, seven years old, never forgot. That sort of family bonding is good for professional development. It allows you to learn teamwork. It allows you to engage in planning. It allows you to engage in savings because when you have two incomes versus one, you can do much more. So, you know, those are the kind of things that really command us, demand from us 
an affinity and a commitment to the family structure because strong families breed strong communities and strong communities build strong nations. And uh, I, I just cannot uh, but thank you, Padre G and Sister Bodhi, Brother Matthew Gall, and Sister Elsie Harry for allowing us to have this kind of exchange and to share ideas on how we can do better by building up the family structure. Thank you very much, Mr. Christian. And even as we explore family dynamics and, and family economics, there is a common uh, trait in afro guyanese families or Caribbean families in general, whereby parents have the tendency to guilt trip their children. So you would hear stuff like, I carried you for nine months and and other, other statements that parents make, I carry you for nine months and I, I take care of you for the past 20 years of your life and all of these stuff. Uh, and children are affected by uh, these guilt tripping attempts in, in an effort to sort of control your behavior. Uh, what would you say to this, um, this practice? Where did it stem from? And how can we eradicate it in our families? Would you like me to go for a system, Bodhi? I'm, I'm thinking. Um, I am not sure where, where this, where the guilt tripping, like you're asking where it came from, but I know that um, sometimes trauma um, shows up in different ways. And so sometimes your mother may say um, something that mean to you. Of course, it is hard to hear. It's, it's emotionally abusive. Um, and and it, it's, it's not something that helps you to grow, um, build your confidence in yourself and things like that. But understand, some of those utterances really come from a place of hurt and pain. A lot of times parents, and, and I'm not excusing it, a lot of times, times um, parents suffer hardship to protect, to provide, to promote their children. And there are times that because of youth and the brain development and the way that children are self-observed, they're really into themselves and what they need. Uh, and they are not sometimes um, very giving. And it seems as though all the sacrifice and all the hard work and all the tears and the blood, um, it seems to that parent as though that is in vain. And so it comes from a place of hurt, not that it is right, but sometimes when you hear your mother, especially if you're a young man of 20 and 25, and you hear your mother say something like that to you, um, if you have the strength, the good thing, the one good thing would be to engage her, or if it's your father, in conversation, because that is coming from a place of deep hurt. And there are other things that she may want to say to you. I constantly talk to people about healthy relationships, uh, respect, going both ways. And it's not that just children are to respect the adults and the parents like we have been all this Thought, but also for adults to respect children by the language they use, by the, the state of readiness. So I mean, where you can sit and engage a child or a young person in conversation, respecting their thought, to respecting their voice, respecting their rights. And so 
it's a wider discussion, um, not just the guilting and, and the things that, that a parent may say to a child, but a wider discussion of building a healthy relationship which the foundational things of love and respect and support and guidance and provision, all of those things are important um, to building that relationship so that we can have less and less of um, utterances that hurt, that wound, and that leave, um, leave us with a lot of unresolved and unprocessed trauma that follows us into adulthood and then affects the behaviors and the relationships that we ourselves um, then get involved in. I am not sure if that answers, but that's the that is the best I can do at this time. Can I take a can I take a <clears throat> strike at it, brother uh, Gall? My father sure, no problem. would always say to me the following: Honor thy mother and thy father. Days shall be long. Honor thy father and thy mother, and your days shall be long. So let's look at the historical construct. Parents in earlier times had children as insurance. It was not only to perpetuate the species, but also to till the fields, tend the animals, do the chores. And since in those days there were no old people's homes, infirmaries and adult daycare and so on, they had children so that when they got old, yes. one or two or at least all of the children in collectivity would assist them as they made their transition to the happy hunting grounds. So I don't see it. I mean, I'm not saying that there aren't people who are selfish, there aren't parents who are maybe, to use a bad word, leeches, you know, they try to leech up their children. But let me just give you my own experience. I was very fortunate to have grown up when I consider everything a modest home, but a very loving home. Well, I remember earlier when I said children are what they learn. So the kindness you do to a child is remembered. And where parents are kind and they do kind things to their children and for their children, the children will remember them. So my father was at a nursing home not far from the office. And I would go see him several times a week. And I would give him, you know, uh, little calendars to hand out to the workers. He actually started sending me business. I think my father must have paid for his funeral from the clients he sent me. But I share this to say there were many people at the nursing home whose family members never came to see them. And human beings are a funny species, Matthew, Elsie, Sister Walker. You know what happened? The patients or the persons at the nursing home whose family members didn't come by to see them often, the nurses took care of them little or none at all. They took it in very poorly. Their care was very poor. But because they saw me coming by and seeing my father and shaving him and taking care of him, giving him a little perfume and so on, they would crowd around and show interest. And so I say all of this to say that when your mother or father, you might think, puts you on a guilt trip, it is true. Mothers carry children for nine months. It is true that there is a sort of intrinsic expectation of reciprocity in human relationships. I mean, a lot of us may be selfless and give gifts to a girlfriend and we don't care for anything in return. Give gifts to a boyfriend and care nothing for anything in return. That is the exception. It's not the norm. If we like somebody, we shower them with affection, we shower them with gifts. Parents give us the gift of life. If that parent was a bad parent, they beat you up, they didn't feed you, they didn't care you, then I don't expect you to grow up with fond memories of them, and you may want to detach yourself from them. On the other hand, you may want to rise in your level of consciousness and understand that they may have not cared for you 
in the way that she, they should have because they themselves may not have had a good life. Or they may not have been as well educated. Or they may not have been as well situated in the economic space in the way of funds and finance and means. So I think one has to always be majestic and philosophical and try to understand our parents. And I think now what Sister Bodhi Walcott said, we need to write our parents' stories. Let me tell you what I've been doing with our mother. I did with my father. And that is we would use the uh, mic, we'd use a tape recorder at one point. Now these phones have uh, tape recorders in them and cameras as well. And just ask them questions and tape record it, you know, and, and, and keep that history. And, and we need to see more from our community. As I see in the African American community, more stories of families. We need to tell more stories of families. We need to be able to go to the bookstore and read about Guyanese families from different communities in Guyana. And I think when we read those stories, it will make for a better national community because we'll realize that all of us face some of the same challenges, had some of the same heartaches, and have had some of the same victories. So uh, when, when you talk of parents who uh, feel that they put in, or you may feel put you on a guilt trip, I respond with one word, duty. Even where our parents may not have been as kind as they should have had uh, in their ability to do, may not have been as empathetic, as sympathetic, as gracious, we have a duty to do better. And we have a duty to understand that they did bring us here. And best we can, we should try to take care of them in their old age. Um, and I'll conclude by saying the uh, very resilient Jewish and Chinese community, sometimes two, three generations live in the same compound up to this day. And I have the feeling with my own children that they find if they stay with me until they are able to have their own homes. I have no problem with it because it's all surrounded by love. Thank you so much, Mr. Christian and Ms. Booty Walcott. And while you were both speaking, I thought about my own parents because for a period of my life, I grew up away from Guyana. And one thing that was clear was that the Guyanese parent was very much different from parents in the islands. Some of the things that my friends were allowed to do, I was not allowed to do. And when they would ask, oh, Elsie, why can't you stay out late? Why can't you go to parties? The one statement that I would use to put it into perspective is that my parents are Guyanese, full <laughs> stop. <laughs> yes. My parents are Guyanese, so <laughs> stop. And over time, they began to understand what that meant. You only needed to say, remember my parents are Guyanese and they understood you couldn't do X, Y, and Z. And today I'm thankful for it because it helped to make me into the person that I am right now. Before we continue with the discussion, I wanna take the opportunity to invite our participants to join us next week and the following week where we're launching a docu-series about the Black experience. So next week, we will be talking about the African female experience and the following week, the African male experience and confronting anti-Blackness in 2020. So this is an invitation for all of our participants that are listening here and on Facebook to mark the date on your calendars to be a part of those series because it Padaji is concerned about the African Guyanese community and the African community worldwide. And so even though our series usually target uh, the African Guyanese community, the African community worldwide, and we speak on topics that are specific to them, we really want to zone in on some of the issues that other African people are confronting around the world and even issues that we are confronting right here as an African Guyanese community. So here ends my little ad break. <laughs> <laughs> and I would like to continue the conversation by asking our two panelists, what are some of the important principles that we learned in African Guyanese families and African families that have helped to mold us into who we are and that we've been able to take into adulthood and into our careers? So one of the um, 
in my family, in my experience, my mother, um, my mother was, is, is 80, 81. Um, this year she's going to be 82, but she was a fierce queen, very strong, hardworking. My mother um, is educated, but not highly certified. So like I would have a master's degree, but my mother is edu it's educated. Um, and so she taught us five girls strength. She taught us to be self-sufficient, no excuses. Um, you couldn't say, well, because or because or because of that. There was one thing my father and my mother taught us. And I'll tell you, um, my father taught us never to, to take money or gifts from men. Well, from anybody, but particularly from men. So that... Um, he, they would always tell us, whatever we need, they will provide. And if they couldn't provide it, then we don't need it. So, you know, things like those, I have taken into, into my adult life. It is not that I don't appreciate community. I thrive on community. I know the community. But I also have from my parents that I am responsible for my success. I can use community, but I cannot use that as an excuse for not getting ahead. And this thing of asking for what you don't have, asking strangers and other people um, for what you don't have is something we were not allowed to do. You bankroll your own life. So again, if you are not able to provide, then you don't need it because you're never allowed um, to act to, to what we call beg, beg for things, right? So for my parents, they taught us education is important. So we all went to school, all tried to finish school so that we can have an education because that was our way out of poverty. My mother taught us self-reliance. Women, we can be fierce, we can work, we should go to school, we can take care of ourselves. And so that remains with me um, onto this day. A family of eight of us, six children, two parents, um, they taught us to share. And this is something I taught my children. And I comment and people will comment. If we have, and I always tell my children, if you come home and you see four, then you take one. If you come home and you see one, you cut it in four and you take a quarter. Recently, I visited with my son. Um, he is 28. Uh, and I came, I came to his house. Uh, my other son, he was there too. And I asked, I said, could I make you all breakfast? Because I don't impose, I don't walk into the space and say, well, I'm the mother and I'm gonna, you know, it's their home. Can I make you breakfast? I said, yeah, mommy make breakfast. I made breakfast and I watched it. They weren't ready for us to all come together to eat. The first one came out, he looked around, he's 26. He opened what I was doing and he said to me, who ate? I felt proud. I smiled to myself and I said, um, no one, I'm waiting on somebody to eat with. He says, okay, let's eat. I kid you not, my older son, he was not ready, like I said, when I made the breakfast. He came out. Evidently, food was eaten because the way the food is, he knows that that can't be food. He says, um, who ate? I said, we both did. He said, oh, okay. Again, if you're there and you see four, take one. 
don't just walk in and believe and just take take care of yourself. Remember that this is a family. And so those are some of the things that I learned from my parents that I teach my children. And I smile all the time when I watch them, grown men, just do the same things or even do it better. It's just amazing. I was there last year and I was visiting with my son and he says, I'll make you breakfast. I said, okay, thank you. And I watched him as though I'm watching myself, you know, and he took the time. He asked just like I would have to them, like, how would you like the eggs? I'm like, oh, okay. And he served the table, make sure he set it, you know, and those little things, they're little things, but they're very meaningful and they help us to position ourselves into the world. And so those, I, I, I have to stop because my heart is feeling warm and I want to share more of, of these wonderful things that are, that are, I'm, I'm reminded of as I speak. And um, so I'll stop there, but those are very precious things to me. And those are things that even in this moment is bringing me so much joy just to talk about it. Thank you so much, Ms. Boudin Walcott. Mr. Christian, what about you? What did you learn in your family that you now take throughout your life? Oh, <laughs> I'm just listening to uh, Sister Booty Walcott and I, I wear, I'm wearing a, a last smile on my face because uh, I'm saying to myself, she uh, raised a very nice son that uh, would make a woman very happy. Oh, yeah. Because, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> because my mother said, uh, my mother said that her father, when observing my father, when he was courting her and my father liked to cook, he said, you'll have a happy life because your husband will never let you go hungry. He likes to cook. And that is so true. My father could make a off, awesome gravy on a Sunday afternoon with chicken and garlic and onions and red beans and rice and so forth and plantains and so on. So the food aspect of life, what Ms. Bodhi said that resonated with me was the whole idea of sharing. Sure. So I've over the past uh, 29 years been in law firms and you have break room and I cannot eat alone. I can't. Not that I am not at alone or I may not eat alone in the future, but it's something that I usually, if I'm on the road going to court, coming from court, if I'm going to buy something for myself, I have to buy for the office. I don't buy all. And that comes from our parenting. So when our parents in the pre-independence period, we only became independent from Britain in 78, so I was a Brit until 17, um, they would go to receptions and so on. We would stay up waiting for them to go home and they'd have a little brown paper bag with a little grease spot at the bottom because you would put a little sandwich or some whatever it is, you know, prunes with, uh, prunes with um, peanut butter and the things that they would serve in Caribbean receptions, you know. We would stay home like little birds waiting for mother hen to come and feed us, you know. We'd... And today I go out on the business dinner. I always, if I don't finish all my food, I save some for my wife or I order a plate to bring home for her and for the kids and they wait up for me. Because you know, daddy never comes home without bringing something. And now as they've gotten older, they quarrel with me because they say I buy too much food and so on. But it's a whole idea of being in a home where sharing and kindness was sort of really preeminent. And so that sort of graciousness and that ability to share with others has helped me in my professional life because law practice is very competitive. Lawyers don't have the best impression in the public mind. Lawyers are seen as sharks, as greedy, wolves. And I believe in the way I was raised and being kind and empathetic and putting myself in other people's shoes, you know? And as, as uh, Sister Bodhi said, the old golden rule, do unto others as you'd like done unto you. That kind of nurturing, that kind of cultivation of my ethic, of my whole persona, I've carried that into my law practice and it has been 
a blessing uh, to not only my staff, but the people I serve, because I serve them with a grateful heart, and I share with them in a way that, you know, I pray with them and I share with them. If they don't have the money, I work with them. And I can tell you when my father died, I looked out at the congregation, maybe a good third or half of the people in the church were old clients. So having a good family life, learning things like kindness, the old golden rule, doing unto others as you'd like done unto you, being uh, taken with duty, being taken with the need to read. You know, we cannot grow a family structure into uh, academic excellence or prosperity if we are not learned. We have to have books in the home. A family that reads is a family that leads. And so that family that is about reading and taking time to have discussions and uh, speaking proper English and staying away from profanity and staying away from drugs and alcohol and so on is a family that ultimately will be respected by neighbors and by the community. So those traits of duty, of teamwork, of sharing, of kindness, of prayerfulness, of industry, I have taken into my professional life and they've been very helpful. And I'll conclude by saying this. We have to do chores. Today, sometimes it's difficult for my kids to um, take the garbage and the recycle bin out to the front, which is about all of 20 to 30 yards. Okay, but we had to do chores. I didn't always like to do my chores. And the last spanking I got from my mother, and my mother, by the way, my mother was the most severe person. My father would say, if you come now, I'll give you six. You come later, I'll give you 12. And I'd run away and so on, wait until he forgot and so on, and go back to the house. My mother said to come here now for a spanking. No negotiation, nothing about six now, 12 later. Come and get it. Sooner the better. And get it over with. And she was a kind person, but she was very severe. So one day, I just started high school, and I went to a friend's home, and I liked reading comics, you know, Spider-Man, Captain America, Submariner, Mighty Thor, Hulk, Spider-Man, and so on. And I stayed there from 9 a.m. on a Saturday to 4 p.m. I come, came home at 4 p.m. My mother said, oh, you didn't do your chores. You came home, you're hungry? Came for lunch? Okay, kneel down. And my mother gave me, I, don't know, I can't remember, but she gave me some solid strokes and, uh, and then said, go wash your face and have your lunch. And then when you're done with your lunch, go scrub whatever I have to scrub or whatever. I remember that today because you know what? It gave me a certain degree of buttressing in that you had to be dutiful, you had to do your work. And later on, when I came to the States and I didn't have money, I worked as a, a janitor in college. I worked on Donald Trump's yacht in Washington, D.C. I worked on the old presidential yacht sequoia. I worked as a cook. I mean, I did all kinds of things because my parents had taught me self-reliance. I was able to work my way through college and law school. And today I look back on them and what they did for me very fondly because they taught me the importance of self-reliance. My sister uh, Bodhi said, not depending on others, begging people to lend them money and so on. I, I, I don't ask people. If I don't have it, I don't have it. Another thing they taught was to be thrifty. Don't reach where your hand cannot reach. Don't leave hang your hand where your hand can't reach. Thank you, Sister Bodhi, for telling it the right way. Don't hang your hat where your hand can't reach. Be thrifty. So early on in life, and I'll conclude with this, we all were given a credit union book, and the book had a, had a saying on the cover. It says, save a penny for a rainy day. So we were all taught to save. And so when I left for the United States, I had money in my credit union book, and I maintain that for many, many years, and I still have some savings on Dominica, and that is the quality of uh, nurturing and cultivation in uh, money management and disciplining and self-reliance that we have to pass on to our kids. Thank you very much, Mr. Christian and Ms. Walcott for sharing the principles that have taken you guys through your lives. Uh, as we wrap up, I would like to ask two final questions. The first is directed to Miss Carlotta, and it's coming from two of our panelists, Thalia and Anastasia. Why is mental health such a taboo topic in the African household? And how can one make it as important as it ought to be? And for Mr. Christian, my sociology lecturer at the University of Guyana 
would always be mourn the fact that there is not enough generational wealth in the afro guyanese community. And he would give examples of businesses on Regent Street, uh, let's say Pago and Sons, Posada and Sons, Singh and Sons, and then a black owned business, Nigel Supermarket, but there was no Ansons. Uh, can you explain why, or is this an accurate reality of the afro Guyanese community? And if so, what advice would you give to young people tuning, in, tuning into this program to ensure that we cultivate the mentality of leaving our wealth for our progeny? Okay. So um, mental health issues. I believe one of the reasons that um, Black people um, are not quite open to uh, mental health services um, is the stigma and judgment that um, surrounds uh, treatment. When you, a lot of times, if you have a mental illness, it is seen, it is seen as some kind of weakness, something about you, you are weak. It is not seen in the same way as though if you have a broken arm or you have leukemia or some other medical issue. And so this stigma about your genes being weak or you, you being weak, um, it's one, I feel one of the reasons um, that black people are opposed. The other, the other one is, you know, we were, we are taught not to air your dirty laundry. Don't go and spread family business. Don't go and um, embarrass the family. So speaking to someone on such private personal matters, being so vulnerable is taboo because it, it, it means you, you are opening up and you are speaking things that are private and personal. A lot of our mental health issues um, significantly related to anxiety, depression, um, high levels of stress, and we're anxious. So we have some anxiety disorders and, and we're depressed. And sometimes talk therapy, along with, with, with pharmacology, some medication, but sometimes just being able to talk to help you to, so you can process what's going on, but you have to share sensitive information. So that stigma and the judgment that comes uh, not so much in Guyana, but I lived and worked in the U.S. for many years. Just access to healthcare and the cost, um, depending on what kind of insurance you have, that is another reason that um, some Black people are unable to access the treatment because of the cost associated with it. So that, that's, that's another reason um, in my judgment. And then de depending on where you are, there are times you cannot, the, the therapist is not culturally competent. I wanna go for a therapist and I, I look through the directory or I call my providers and they give me people who don't look like me, who don't understand my experience. Um, and so, and they, they don't even try to understand my experience. And that's another reason um, why some black people uh, do not access uh, mental health uh, services. Of course, religion and culture, thinking that, you know, if you have a mental issue, maybe it's because you, you have some kind of evil spirits. Uh, so sometimes it has to do as well with how you socialize, raise your culture, your religion and so on. So that is another aspect uh, as to why in African-American or Af Afro-Guyanese or just black people's community that we do not seek out uh, therapy um, as, as much.
Well said, uh, Sister Bodhi. If I can just add to it, I think uh, my, my mom worked as a mental health nurse, and so I grew up knowing people who were mentally uh, ill. And, um, you know, it's a stigma in many societies. It's not unique to African diaspora communities. Um, I think we deal best with that uh, sort of stigma by education. Ignorance is, 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 is really a hindrance to understanding that people through stress, uh, through genetic uh, bases or uh, traumatic events uh, can on occasion uh, have nervous breakdowns and have uh, mental issues. And again, it's something that you have to deal with a great deal of understanding and care. And that's where the education comes in. Um, and that's 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 as far as, as, far as that's concerned. Um, Brother uh, Gall talked about uh, Poseidon's sons. In Dominica, as in Guyana, you have people who are what you call Syrian, people who came from Lebanon and who came in and so on. They never had the destruction of their family unit. They came from trading, from areas where trading was prized. In the whole transatlantic slave trade and the Holocaust, you had that disruption where people were all mixed up and brutalized. And despite that, we have been able to rise. However, you've seen more African diasporans move towards the professions, the army, the police, the civil service, doctors, lawyers, less so in industry, as in you know shops and supermarkets and farmland and so on. I work with the National Black Growers Council. This is the biggest black families in America. And they're, they're working to, to change that because even in the African diaspora situation, we left the land because the land to us represented slavery and the brutality that came with slavery, and not understanding that agriculture is a very important profession. We run off fuel as human beings. That fuel is food. And if we don't have food, and we don't have a, a sort of dominion over the production of food, we expose ourselves, we expose our flanks to being manipulated and being abused. So we have to maintain, despite the vicissitudes of slavery, an understanding of agriculture, an understanding of things as in Sister Bodhi's uh, Walcott's mention of uh, mental illness and the way we can deal with it through education and putting resources to dealing with it as opposed to putting money into police forces, maybe more money into social services so folks can be assisted out of their predicament. And then uh, finally, uh, of course, the whole issue of uh, what Brother uh, Matthew Gall talked about, how do we create the basis for the transgenerational transfer of wealth? Three things I'll leave you with, Brother Matthew, and your audience. We need to always, as soon as we can, take out insurance policies. How many of us do that? The older you are, the more expensive it is. And you pass away, you leave 100,000, 200,000 in an uh, insurance policy. Your family can bury you and can buy some property. You can buy some land. You can create a trust. We need to also have a serious savings culture. We can't spend everything we get on trifles, cars, things that depreciate, buy property buy land, and if you can get involved in industry, do that. But it's good to have your own home. That home can serve as collateral for a loan, to do business, to send someone to school. That land can serve as collateral for a business loan, to send someone to college, okay? And thirdly, we must make our plans. You cannot run around in life without sitting down and writing out in a journal what your plans are. So I believe in diaries. I give diaries as gifts to my class because as a child, I would write out what I wanted to be from age 10 and 11. I'd read the biography of great men, Winston Churchill, Fidel Castro, Abraham Lincoln. I'm a big Lincoln fan. And all of these people had challenges and they were able to overcome them. Churchill was a very poor student. Lincoln got depressed, almost committed suicide, went bankrupt. Yet they were able to overcome their challenges. So reading leads to writing, leads to a better understanding of, of life. But uh, just to address your issue of the commercial aspect, uh, that's what we need to do. I wanted to give some specific examples of things we can do. Keep our health, buy insurance, not only for yourself, for your children as well. The earlier you get it for them, the better. And if that death is a reality. We will all at one point in time die. But if you die with a policy that allows for a payout, you can leave your family in a better place than, than you, of course, were. Uh, and so these are some of the little tidbits, I think, that could be helpful to families and helping families 
engage the transgenerational transfer of wealth. Because with those insurance policy dividends, you can then buy property, and that property can be handed down. It can serve as collateral to do great many things, business, loans, education loans, and the like. Thank you so much, Mr. Christian, and thank you, Ms. Budi Walcott. We are all out of time for our discussion tonight, but I just wanna say thank you so much to our panelists and thank you to everyone for tuning in. When you leave this program, I wanna encourage you to head on over to Channel 11 to watch a program by one of our sister organizations called Ikemba. And it's on Channel 9 at 9 p.m. And they will be speaking about reparatory justice and other matters that are relevant to the African Guyanese community and the African community worldwide. And also next week, I want to encourage you to tune in to our program. It will be an exceptional program. We will be uh, showing some one-minute videos that have been produced by people of African descent mm -hmm. from different parts of the world talking about their experience with anti-blackness and of course we will have some exceptional panelists speaking mm -hmm. about the african female experience and then the following week the african male experience remember to like our facebook pages it padigy youth movement international decade for people of african descent assembly guyana facebook page and also the padigy credit union facebook page and for those of you interested in signing up for our credit union you will find steps on how to do so on our credit union Facebook page. It Padachi has lots of things going on, many activities. Please follow our social media so that you can keep up with them and participate in them. And please encourage your friends and family members to also participate. Thank you so much to our exceptional panelists, Ms. Carlotta Booty Walcott and Mr. Gabriel Christian. Thank you for the wealth of knowledge that you have imparted to us and to our participants. Without you, we could not have a Spill the Facts program. So thank you. Thank you to my co-host, Matthew Gall, and we really hope that we will see you next time. Have a good evening. Thanks. Good evening. Oh, and Mr. Christian says, don't forget the first annual Guyana Family Reunion. We'll be working on that, Mr. Christian. Thank you. Just me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye. Take care, Ms. Brody. Bye. Bye.